Good uh, morning, uh, everyone, and uh, can I welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the Welfare uh, Reform Committee in 2013. Uh, I am the observant among you will notice I am in the uh, chair today. Uh, sadly, uh, the convener uh, is uh, at a funeral and un unable to attend. Has sent his apologies. So can I welcome uh, Jackie Bailey, who, who is here uh, substituting uh, for him on behalf of uh, the Labour Party? Can I remind uh, everyone uh, to please? either uh, switch uh, their mobile phones uh, and other electronic devices off or onto airplane mode. I'm not quite sure what airplane mode is, but if you know what it is, feel free to utilise it. Okay, uh, agenda item one is uh, the, uh, 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 the fact that we have uh, two items of administrative uh, business to consider, uh, first of all, uh, uh, this morning. Uh, can I invite uh, members to consider whether we should take agenda item five uh, on our uh, agenda this morning in private. Can, can I ask a question? Uh, because we got the private paper for committee members only, um, and I, I think I've seen this uh, on, online. Um, I think it may have been Holyrood magazine that, that had it online. Can I ask if, if that is the case or not, first of all, if, if the clerks are aware of this? Uh, Yes, they we discussed this with the clerks the, the other day. I think it was inadvertently uh, published online. I think it was Holyrood magazine had uh, picked uh, uh, up on it, Kevin, so I think that is the case. Convener, the fact that that paper has been uh, made public, um, is it right that we should then go on to discuss the content, contents of that paper in private? Well, I'm, I'm uh, uh, relaxed now, but I'm happy to ask uh, for views from other uh, members. Uh, Alec? Uh, I understand uh, exactly the point that Kevin's making, but I would actually reverse it and say it would be inappropriate for us to change our decisions as a result of a paper that uh, may have been published accidentally or uh, in similar circumstances perhaps leaked in future. So as a result, I think we should stick to the plan uh, rather than uh, have circumstances dictate to us. Okay, although I would remind members we haven't actually made a decision yet, yeah. but I, I appreciate your perspective. Do other members have anything they want to say on the matter? Linda? To pick up on something Alec just said, can we clarify how it ended up in the public domain? Because um, you know, the word leak is being used like Alec just said. I, 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 should I, have I, it sorry, sorry, hold, hold on. Uh, uh, right. I think, uh, to be clear, it was just a ministry of error. Right, this, okay. Uh, the circumstance, uh, uh, Linda, so just to clarify that point. Any other comments? Convener, um, I think that probably everybody knows the committee's views that it would rather have a formal session uh, with uh, Mr Duncan Smith rather than an informal session, uh, but unfortunately Westminster ministers continue uh, to, to fail uh, to, to come forward and give evidence in public, which I'm sure the people of Scotland uh, would want to see too. Um, on this occasion, hearing that it was an administrative error, um, uh, I hope that every other um, body, uh, in, including the media, will have access to that private paper since it in, inadvertently went out. I'm happy uh, to have the discussion uh, in private on this occasion. Uh, but, you know, I, I do have a, 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 a feeling that if something has been in the public domain, um, then it should go to, to every organisation and, and not just the one if it went to them only inadvertently. <clears throat> OK. I mean, I should say, I think, and the uh, clerks can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I don't think it went to Hollywood magazine inadvertently. I think it was published online inadvertently. So I think Hollywood uh, were just eagle-eyed and happened to notice it. Um, so uh, it was, albeit briefly, uh, available at uh, university. But in terms of whether or not we take it in private, what is the feeling amongst uh, the committee? I'm relaxed either way. I don't know how uh, other... Sorry. <clears throat> I don't think there's any need to have the discussion in private okay. based on what the discussion we've just had. <laughs> uh, like, like you from there, I'm pretty relaxed either way. Not all the way. Um... You know, I'm relaxed too, but I, I'd seem to, I, I would probably err on the side of just having it in public because the, the document's in the public domain. I, I, I don't see how you, what would be the kind of logical point of discussing a document in private that's already been published. Okay, well, I'm getting the sense that um, the feeling is uh, towards uh, having it in public. Um, I mean, are, are, is the committee relaxed with that approach? Notwithstanding your comments, Alec. Okay, we're agreed we'll have that uh, session in uh, public. Okay. Um, 
And uh, <laughs> having uh, discussed that, uh, agenda item two, the second item on the agenda is to invite us to uh, consider whether to take business and private future uh, meetings uh, and that business in this uh, 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 regard is concerned is consideration of evidence that we hear at our next few meetings in relation to the regulations on passported benefits and consideration of any draft reports on the regulations in that relation to that, are we agreed to have those sessions in private? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Right, we turn to uh, agenda uh, item uh, three, subordinate uh, legislation, council tax uh, regulations. Uh, this uh, is to allow us to uh, consider two pieces of uh, subordinate uh, legislation which make amendments to the principal uh, regulations for the council tax reduction scheme uh, and uh, paper number one that has been uh, circulated uh, briefly sets at the background to these uh, regulations. Uh, the observant amongst you will notice we have uh, Robin Haynes and Jenny Bruff from the Scottish Government who are here to uh, answer any questions uh, the uh, committee uh, may uh, have. They're not here to make a, a statement uh, or provide evidence per se, but if anyone has any questions for them, they are here to uh, uh, answer them. So do members have any uh, comments or questions on these uh, regulations? Ian? Uh, well, convener, I mean, obviously, uh, the um, further correspondence we've seen around the appeals procedure raises. Sorry, Ian, can I stop you there? We'll move yeah. on to, to that. This is about the regulation. The very next thing we'll discuss is the, the further right, correspondence. Okay. So, Sorry, my, on my the, uh, reg the regulations before us, are there any comments or questions? And I'll come to you first on the, that, uh, Ian, okay? Jackie. Um, I'm apologise, convener. I was only told late last night that I was coming today, otherwise I would have checked this for myself. But I'm curious... That's funny, Jackie. I'd been told earlier in the day you were coming, so I must have known something you had. <laughs> well, anyway. you certainly have missed something, because I didn't know till last night. Um, the, the regulations were considered by the Subledge Committee. Um, I don't have a report of the Subledge Committee discussion, but I noticed that they were agreed on division. Um, would it be appropriate to... Well, maybe not ask the government what happened at Subledge, um, but for you to advise the committee of what the, that discussion was? Well, my understanding is um, there uh, was a, a division, uh, I think it was four to three, uh, in favour of uh, it being uh, competent to move forward with uh, these regulations. I'm not aware of the, the detail of the discussion at Subordinate uh, Legislation Committee, but if you have questions uh, about the uh, Varies nature of uh, these regulations, then by all means you should feel free to ask the uh, government officials. Okay, on that basis, um, it, my understanding therefore from what the convener has said is that there may be some question over the powers that the Scottish Government has in relation to these regulations. Could you perhaps expand on, on your view of the situation? Um, my understanding, I wasn't at either meeting of the sub-legislative sub committee, but um, they had a very similar discusson when they considered the, uh, the, mu the much longer regulations that set out the council tax reduction scheme, um, and again they divided. Um, the Scottish Government has been very clear that these regulations are made under Section 80 of the Local Government Finance Act 1992. And the essence of these uh, are about um, filling the hole that's created by the UK government's abolition of council tax benefit, which is a fundamental part of the benefit system and therefore absolutely reserved, and moving assistance to the vulnerable in, in meeting their council tax liability to, um, away, from, away from the social security system to the local taxation system. And therefore, the Scottish Government is quite comfortable that the matter is absolutely within the competence of the Parliament. It remains the case that the, the subordinate legislation's legal advisers um, weren't satisfied. Can you tell me on what precise basis they weren't satisfied, given that you will have considered their argument too? Um, I think the Government's position is made um, in, their res in, in our response to the committee's questions uh, at the time the original regulations were made. Sorry, that wasn't my question. <laughs> um, and well, I to think be fair, Jack, I think you're asking them to comment on someone else's uh, precise legal position, which is legitimate to do, but, you know. Which, which equally, having checked with you first, convener, mm. you told me to go ahead and question them. Well, so, I didn't know your question so, was going to be, I'm not Well, psychic, well I kind but. of asked you that question on the basis that um, any government would have considered, you know, what's being said 
against their proposition, mm -hmm. um, I'm asking you know, what precisely the arguments were and how the government overcame them. I've heard the government side of it. I haven't heard um, the precise nature of the arguments. Well, um, I regret I don't have a response okay. to, to the committee to hand. If I did, I'd be able to read them out um, and we'd be very happy to, to ensure that the committee has um, co copied that again, if that was helpful. Okay. The ESA, Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I just was trying to recall maybe the clerks could help. Did we not have a, a brief discussion on this point uh, with respect to the, 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 the underlying um, more comprehensive uh, regulations? I'm looking at the clerks here. I, I, I seem to recall that we my did. Re my recollection was, in was this committee. specifically about uh, uh, this. But, uh, I, I, no, I seem to recall there was a... We, I may be wrong, but with respect to the, the 2012 council tax reduction regulations, that, that this issue was flagged up in one of our papers, and we did have a brief discussion in this Welfare Reform Committee, mm -hmm. and that we yes, agreed that there was no issue. The, the parent regulation, yes. if I can uh -huh. call it that, and uh, we had at that time, I think, both these officials briefly before us, although I don't think there are any questions at that stage from what mm -hmm. I remember. I mean, my understanding is that the, 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 the issue here is that, you know, a, a benefit is, is, is the provision of, of public money to meet a liability, and this is actually a reduction of the liability. That's my understanding of the legal position, and indeed, in light of what Westminster is doing and taking away this, this uh, benefit, um, what the Scottish Government is doing has, is uh, to find a mechanism which I believe it has successfully done to fill the gap and assist uh, as the, the, one of the, the officials said, vulnerable people in Scotland, that's what I understand that the government is doing. And the mechanism is to reduce the liability further to its powers uh, in terms of, of council tax. So uh, for me, the issue as a lawyer actually is, is quite clear. Okay, thank you, Annabelle. Can I just ask a, a question of clarification? If these regulations weren't to be put through, what would be the practical effect on people on the ground? Sorry, if these regulations were or were not weren't put through, if it was the, the case that they weren't uh, agreed, what, what um, would be? If the amending regulations were not to be put through, um, there would be a number of practical effects. Um, firstly, the amending regulations address a number of specific points raised by the subordinate legislation committee. Um, secondly, the amending regulations reflect the UK government's um, social security benefit uplift um, that was announced just before Christmas. Um, the, although this isn't a benefit, they are quite important in as much as entitlement to council tax reduction, which in turn replicates existing entitlement to council tax benefit, um, very much ref is, is a function of um, the applicant's deemed income, less their living expenses. Not every benefit is disregarded in that calculation of income. So if some benefits increase and you don't increase their allowable living expenses, it could have resulted in some individual's council tax reduction actually being less than it would otherwise have been. So we are increasing, whilst, whilst the UK government is increasing some incomes, we're also increasing some of their deemed living expenses. I hope we don't take this the wrong way, Mr. That was quite a technical answer. What yeah. I really meant was if I'm a person in receipt of council tax benefit, these regulations, these are many regulations that go through, what's the effect for me as an individual? you would uh, potentially have to pay, because of the, the rather complicated thing I've just tried, and obviously not described terribly well. No, you described it perfectly well, <laughs> but I think in terms you would, of you would be, you, Your council tax liability would be greater than it would otherwise be. Um, could, I mean, to, is there any sort of, do you have any sort of figures in terms of what the average might be for an individual in receipt of council tax benefit? Uh, no, I don't, um, but it has been put to us by practitioners in local authorities and indeed COSLA that um, if the uh, regulations um, were not to go through and the, be the benefits up rating was not to be applied, local authorities would find themselves um, chasing large numbers of very trivial amounts of council tax. So there would be a considerable administrative burden on them and indeed quite a compliance burden on a large proportion of the 560,000 people who who receive, so this who will be, receive council this tax would negatively, reduction. It would negatively impact not only on the individual, but also on local authorities as well? It would. Um, um, and the, the burden on local authorities would be particularly acute in that the timing has been rather less than ideal um, through the, the entire development of these regulations. Mm -hmm. um, very much, the timescales are very much imposed upon us and not yeah. of our own design. 
Um, and because the original regulations were laid and came into were laid just before Christmas and came into force in January, um, there was a, a slightly uncomfortable situation whereby the people that developed the software that local authorities used to administer the scheme were developing that software before the regulations came into force. Um, through about the first six weeks of this year, local authorities have then been testing that software, uh, installing it and training people. And that, that software releases actually reflect, my understanding is they reflect the uh, benefits uplift figures that are in these uh, regulations. Again, this is not an ideal circumstance, but it reflects the timescales that have been imposed upon us. So if these regulations were not to go through, local authorities would have to unpick those changes that they've, they've, uh, they have adopted for the time being, um, revert to the original figures and uh, effectively run council tax billing again uh, in very short order. Kev? Kev? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Haynes stated there that there would be an effect on 560,000 individuals if this regulations did not go through. Um, could Mr. Haynes maybe give us an indication uh, out of that? Could he confirm that 560,000 uh, figure? Uh, and could he give us an indication of how many um, working families would be affected uh, if this regulations did not go through? Um, first of all, the 560,000 figure itself I use is, is, is very much shorthand. It fluctuates each, each month and there's a degree of seasonality. I think the last actual figure I saw was slightly more than 560,000. Um, I think it was about 565,000. Um, I don't, to hand, have the figure of the number of working adults, but we're very happy to, to uh, investigate that and report back to the committee. Convener, even though the figure fluctuates, it would be fair to say um, that over half a million families, half a million individuals, uh, both working and non-working, would be affected if this reduction uh, does not go through. Yes, that's fair to say. Thank you. Is that everyone sat satisfied just now? Okay, well then, uh, Ian had uh, hinted at the other issue. We do have a uh, paper before us uh, in relation to uh, the appeals mechanism uh, uh, about uh, uh, for the council tax reduction, the council tax reduction uh, scheme, uh, uh, and uh, if other members uh, uh, have any questions or any comments they want to make, then they should certainly feel free. But I'll turn to Ian first of all. I mean, I think everyone on the committee appreciates how important it is that these regulations are in place and they work and they're legal. And, and part of that, uh, to, in my understanding, would be that um, there is some appeals process so that decisions on council tax reduction can be appealed. Um, and I, it, it clearly, it's extremely unfortunate that we reach the position, as I understand uh, the Cabinet Secretary's letter, that no such appeal procedure is in place. Uh, my concern about that is, I mean, I worry what, uh, I want to ask what the implications are in terms of uh, ECHR compliance, for example, of the regulations, if they include within them a decision against which, as, as we stand today, that there is no system of, of appeals. Well, first of all, the law as it stands, um, would, would mean that an appeal would be against somebody's uh, council tax liability and therefore, as I say, the law as it stands would say that should go to the Valuation Appeals Committee. However, we are where we are. Um, looking to the commencement of the scheme, um, if somebody wish, wished to contest their um, council tax reduction assessment, um, they should do exactly what they would do at the moment under council tax benefit. Um, in that their first port of call should be the local authority and their decision or determination would be reviewed by, um, if you like, different officials within that local authority. If council tax benefit were not to be abolished and it was to roll forward from April the 1st and that individual still wished to contest their claim, then at present they would take that um, appeal to the UK Tribunal Service mm -hmm. and it would be heard in the Social Entitlement Chamber. My understanding is, having read uh, some of their, their, their literature on their website, is um, 
they would expect to deal with an appeal be uh, between three and eight months. So that eight months, if, uh, I mean, first of all, we wouldn't expect appeals to be made on the 1st of April, whether it would be under council tax benefit if it was to continue or the new council tax reduction scheme. It is highly unlikely appeals would be made on the 1st of April. But if they were, and, if, and council tax benefit was to be rolled forward, it is quite possible that that appeal would not be heard until November this year. Um, so whilst we are in the position that uh, is set out in the Cabinet Secretary's letter, um, we would be confident that we could get something in place in a time scale that hopefully could actually better that. And, and in that, that position to a degree is informed by the likely number of appeals, which again is set out in the Cabinet Secretary's letter. Um, last year there were, if memory serves, 459 appeals in Scotland against council tax benefit determinations. Of those, um, I think something like 380 um, were joint appeals um, uh, in relation to council tax and housing benefit determinations. Um, rolling forward, um, entitlement to a council tax reduction um, very much replicates entitlement to housing benefit and indeed uh, they will be administered by the same people. So if someone is going to appeal on their, their council tax reduction, there is a very good chance that they will also be appealing a housing benefit. Um, and that will have due process through the UK Tribunal Service. So one thing we are also considering is um, exploring a, the, the idea of local authorities adopting a protocol. This is very much as a backstop whereby um, a housing benefit appeal is heard uh, and the local authority agrees to abide by that in relation to their council tax reduction. That is one option. We are exploring others with uh, Jim McCafferty and the AJTC. Uh, 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 I, I appreciate that options are being explored and that's, uh, you know, I don't think anybody doubts the um, Scottish Government's desire to have an appeals process in place. But nonetheless, as of today, there is no such process in place. And I you, you, you said there, uh, Mr Haynes, that um, you're confident that it can be in place in time to deal with appeals. But the legislation which has, has led to the situation we're in, the legislation to abolish council tax benefit, was passed in early 2011. So um, I, I just wonder why we should have confidence, given that we've had, uh, what, 18, the, mo 18 months? The legislation... this point uh, now, so, sorry, where sorry, we, don't, um, we don't actually have an appeals procedure in place. The why, legislation why that abolishes council tax... Hold on, Mr. Sorry. Why should we believe the second attempt right. will deliver in a matter of months? The legislation, if I may correct, uh, correct something you just said, uh, the legislation that abolishes council tax benefit is the UK Government's Welfare Reform Act. Uh, this only received royal assent, my understanding, is in March last year, if memory serves, not 2011. None, 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 nonetheless... A, that's royal assent, which isn't, you know, the knowledge that this was coming goes back before that. And even then, it's a year. So you're asking us to have confidence that a system can be put in place in a matter of months. But in any case, my more fundamental question, I think, is if the regulations before us, the subordinate legislation before us, puts in place a process which does not have, when the Parliament agrees it, a proper compliant appeals procedure in place, is there not then a problem of the competency of, of the legislation? I mean, that's not a happy position, but is that not the actual position that we're in? Um, I think I would contest that interpretation and in that the appeals procedure is, as I say, is set out in the 1992 Local Government Finance Act. And the alternative arrangements that we now are exploring with great haste because of the situation we now found ourselves in would also be uh, subject to secondary legislation made under the 1992 Local Government Finance Act. So, sorry, you're, you're saying that there is an appeals procedure in place under previous legislation for council tax reduction, which doesn't exist until these regulations go through. I don't follow that. Uh, I, th I think, as, as I was trying to say, is the appeals procedure that we were anticipating using is, is already set out in primary legislation. 
and it is that that we now find we can no longer use. The alternative arrangements would require further legislation to be laid, secondary legislation to be laid using powers under section 80 and 81 of the 1992 Local Government Finance Act. And that they will be laid in the usual fashion, they'll be subject to scrutiny? Absolutely, yes. Sorry, do you have anything else? Okay. okay. Uh, Kevin, then Linda. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Mr. Haynes, you said that uh, great haste uh, uh, was being uh, uh, was in place to to make sure that an alternative was in place. How long do you think that it will be before an alternative is in place? Would that be before uh, November, as you said, it would be before many of these appeals would be held if it, if it went to a UK tribunal? That is our ambition, and we'd very much hope to better that. I'd be reluctant to commit myself to a particular date. Um, lest we slipped by a couple of days, for example. Um, but work is proceeding with great haste. We now have the greater part of the scheme um, away from our desks and we're able to turn our absolute attentions to ensuring that an appeals mechanism can be put in place. We also have um, probably the most experienced practitioner in Scotland now uh, working with us, uh, trying to identify solutions. And we're also engaged the, uh, the statutory advisor on administrative justice to ensure that um, people's rights are indeed going to be protected under whatever arrangements are brought forward. Um, you said um, that uh, 459 appeals took place last year, of which 380 were joint appeals, council tax and housing benefit. Did I get that right? Uh, that sort of number, I think, I think the letters met, the, 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 the absolute ones may be laid out in Mr Swinney's letter of 26. Uh, but those numbers are certainly certainly ones that I recognise. So, so what we're talking about is 79 cases where there were council tax appeals only. Would that be about right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in a year? Yes. Um, and to stall uh, this regulations would affect some uh, 560,000 individuals for a situation at present where um, there may be, may be uh, some difficulty in finding an appeal mecha mechanism in the near future for around about 79 cases. Would that be about right? Um, I think that's that's a reasonable thing to say. That would be fair. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Linda, we follow by Jackie. Yeah, I, I just can be you know, just, um, you know, uh, what, want to make sure that what we're doing here is trying as far as possible not to disadvantage people who have had this imposed on them. Um, you know, against the, well, I would say against the will of the Scottish people and against the will of the yeah, Scottish yeah. government, certainly. Uh, so can we get this right? We're talking about, you know, to follow on what Kevin said, even if we don't finesse the, the different joint appeals and things, we're talking about less than 0.1% of those who will potentially get council tax reduction who may appeal, judging by previous figures. Um, if... if if, I think if that is what 80 out, over 560,000 <laughs> comes out at, then yes. yes. But we, we won't test your maths. So. <laughs> I, I was talking even about the original 459 is still less than 0.1%. Um, I just want that on record because I don't want us to be in a position of making people think that they are going to be very disadvantaged here. And you're saying that you're working together with others to look for a system that can properly address these issues and perhaps it may even be possible to improve um, the way that these things are dealt with by your discussions, I presume, through local authorities, COSLA, etc., and the current appeals tribunal. Um, well, that, you make quite an interesting point. I've seen the letter from the Scottish Campaign and Welfare Reform that actually mm -hmm. expresses some reservations about um, the, the original appeals mechanism that was identified. Um, so, perhaps, so perhaps, although we find ourselves in an uncomfortable position, it may ultimately prove to be serendipitous. I wish not put my mask to the test, I think it's close to 0.01% of our <laughs> Jackie? Um, I think you make the point for me, convener. It, at the end of the day, irrespective of the numbers, um, there is an issue about whether there is an appeals mechanism or not at the point where we transition um, into um, the benefit being, being dealt with in Scotland. So, in practice, there is nothing on the ground from the 1st of April. Um. On the 1st of April, as I said earlier, um, somebody who wishes to contest their, sure. their um, deemed entitlement to council tax reduction should do exactly what they do at present under council tax benefit. 
in that the first port of call is their local authority and they can ask for their case to be reviewed. Absolutely, but the mechanism for review um, is yet to be determined. Is no, the point there, there would be an internal review within a local authority okay. where, a, where, where a different worker, a different administrator would look at it. Okay. And that's exactly and what happens. At do they then go to tribunal or is it the case that you still have to put in place the appeals mechanism? If, um, sorry, are you talking about under council tax benefit or, or, or the future council tax reduction scheme? Future. Okay. Future. Okay. That's what we're considering. Um, at present, there is there is no appeals mechanism. Okay. So and that what I'm what asking we, you, yes, okay, and that is, is what we are seeking to address. Right. So, it, given that in practice, on the ground, there will be nothing beyond the internal review, but but the kind of appeals mechanism we're here discussing won't be on the ground on the first of April. Just so that I'm clear about that, you anticipate that it will be on the ground um, to hear first appeals by November. Um, that's not quite what I said. Oh, I, sa I said okay. um, the UK Tribunal Service, if, if they were in receipt of an appeal, may not be able to determine that until November, and we have ambitions to get something in place that could better that. Okay. okay. Um, your ambitions relate to what kind of time scale? If it's not November and the UK Tribunal Service, what time scale do you anticipate for this happening? Um, Again, I wouldn't like to commit myself to a particular point in time or a date, but um, our rough working estimates are looking to something in summer. Okay, that's very helpful to know. Um, is it the case that when somebody lodges an appeal, for example, on the 1st of April or at some point thereafter, um, their existing entitlement would continue until the appeal is heard? Or are people basically parked on new entitlement until the point that their appeal is heard? There, um, I will look to my colleague here, but my understanding is that they would, uh, their, their calculated, their deemed entitlement would, would prevail. Okay. I, I'm, I would be very concerned, as I said, if people were to be appealing on the 1st of April. Oh, indeed, but, but, uh, but so also I, I, I think... I suspect that would be quite a hypoth hypothetical situation. Sure, but I also think you would share my concern of, you know, people who are delayed in terms of an appeals process that perhaps might not retain their existing entitlement. So I'm checking if that backstop is there until such time as an appeal is heard. Can I clarify that question when you refer to the previous entitlement? Um, when their entitlement is determined for CTR, um, if that's what they don't agree with, then, then that's what they can ask to be reviewed. But that is their entitlement for council tax reduction. Um, was, was that what you were referring to? Normally it is the case that you know, if you have an existing entitlement, okay, um, that entitlement is preserved whilst you're going through appeal. If people are financially disadvantaged, okay, it could the, any delay in an appeal will compound that disadvantage. So what I'm interested in is the protection for the individual and the speed of the process. I think that's one we would we would take away. Um, okay, that's helpful. Like Thank you. you keep, um, um, thanks for coming. If if I've if I've got your question right, I mean supposing supposing we were to apply the timetable that the UK Tribunal Service um, suggests would ap could apply and somebody applied for their council tax reduction in the 1st of April, the local authority made a particular determination, it went through internal review within the local authority, they then appealed that, the appeal heard it, then went to November and said, ah no, in point of fact, the entitlement for a reduction was greater, then the local authority would rebill mm -hmm. backwards. Yep, okay. But would it's they a, seek to... Sorry, Jackie, Kim, sorry. I think I've just got a brief okay. supplementary on this very question. Thanks. I will come back to you, Kim. I, I think uh, it, it's going back a little bit convener now, but in terms of the internal uh, local government uh, processes, the review that they carry out, on average, how long would it take a local authority to complete that review? I genuinely don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I wonder if Ms Bruff has any idea? I, I could only speculate. I, I, I think that be. that would be um, very interesting for uh, us to know, Convener, uh, because uh, having come from a local government background, I know that these processes uh, often take uh, a very long time indeed. Um, uh, and uh, I, I would go back a number of years to, to have a case that I was involved in. Uh, but if my memory uh, serves me right, 
it may be upwards of three months to deal with it internally. Okay. I, 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 that, I think, needs to be checked. I think it's important that okay, we get we'll, that. We can reflect on that uh, when we, we come to uh, consider the, these uh, uh, regulations. Back to Jackie. And then Thank you very I much. Bring and I, I, I will move us on very, very quickly. Um, my concern in, in passing legislation is that we, we need to ensure its compliance and its adequacy for the job at hand. Um, my genuine concern is, despite what you're saying about the primary legislation that may be there, in practice, our appeals mechanism is not on the ground. It's not contained in secondary legislation at this point in time. We would be passing an instrument, and I'm not suggesting we do otherwise, but my major concern is that this is not ECHR compliant and that you may run into difficulties as a consequence of that. What can you say to reassure me that I'm entirely wrong? Um, I, I think as a humble official, <laughs> I'm probably not best placed to provide that assurance. I think the, the, the insurance that, that I would point you towards would be that set out in the Cabinet Secretary's letter of February the 26th, which I, I hope conveys his, his com commitment to making sure something is in place. I suppose I'm not asking you as a politician. I'm asking you um, as, I'm assuming, a, a, an official, a lawyer, perhaps. Um, it is the legislation before us that I'm concerned with, not your intentions. Both the Cabinet Secretary and you have made clear the intentions. I'm asking, you know, are we in danger of passing legislation that is inadequate because these arrangements aren't in place and therefore not ECHR compliant because there is no appeals mechanism, irrespective of the number of appeals that may or may not come forward? Um. I think the best reply I can give to that is the regulations that you have in front of you were never intended to create or establish an appeals mechanism. It is not their purpose. Okay. Okay. Uh, Alec. Okay. Um, I have to say that I'm basically looking for the same reassurances that uh, Jackie Bailey is looking for. Uh, having heard the discussion, uh, I see no alternative but to approve these regulations. Uh, because so many people are dependent on them and the time scales involved uh, are such that it, uh, I think it would be inappropriate for us to do anything else. But I'm looking for that same reassurance that uh, we are in a position where we will have a, an appeals mechanism in place that will protect individuals from any disadvantage that they may experience by virtue of the fact that it will not be in place on the 1st of April. Um, perhaps, uh, um, again, the be the be maybe a different assurance I could offer you would be to demonstrate the, the fact that we are now working on this almost full time. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I spent two hours with Jim McCafferty yesterday. We are scheduled to meet um, the UK Tribunal Service uh, at the beginning of next week. Um, we're continually engaging with COSLA in this, we're continually engaging with the profession on this. Um, we have other engagement with the Ministry of Justice uh, to explore particular avenues there. Um, as I say now, as I, I think I said earlier, uh, now that our desks are clear of the main rump of the regulations, um, this is getting the absolute focus of our uh, attention just now. And time scale, scale is a, the significant factor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, some of your colleagues have tried to make me commit to a date. <laughs> um, the best I can give at present is, is um, to repeat the ambition that I gave earlier, that we would hope to be able to come forward with something in the summer. Thank you. Annabelle. Oh, thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, just picking up a, a couple of points. Um, one, I mean, I, I note in the letter from the Cabinet Secretary of 26 February that he uh, provides some background as to discussions with the Scottish Valuation Appeals Committee Forum. Uh, and um, uh, he, he said that um, his officials met representatives from that forum in April 2012 to discuss um, intentions and implications for valuation appeals committees. And those discussions continued, uh, and there were indeed a number of ex subsequent exchanges over the course of the summer of 2012, and that culminated in... Uh, uh, representatives of the forum engaging on a number of detailed points and identifying a likely training need uh, for Valuation Appeals Committee members and secretaries uh, around the time of implementation. And then the Cabinet Secretary goes on to state that having, it appeared, reached an agreement on the way forward, it was therefore, as he terms it, disappointing, uh, and I quote, 
uh, that it was not until 22 November 2012 that the Valuation Appeals Committees first expressed a very different view of their ability or indeed willingness to take on CTR appeals, end of quote. So I think that's important to understand some of the background to this. Um, uh, and, you know, in terms of timing, that already has been discussed. This is, uh, uh, this is legislation that uh, has derived, as far as I understand it, from the Scottish Government's absolute determination to ensure that people do not lose out uh, further to the Westminster Government's welfare reform uh, proposals in this area. Uh, and therefore, the timing has not been of their making and that they have tried to do their utmost to have everything in place uh, and indeed, that is the, the nature of the, 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 the supplementary regulations we're looking at today. Uh, uh, so I think that's important to bear in mind. Um, I, I take your point about that. First of all, these regulations, all legislation that comes before our committees is, I understand, uh, already uh, proof tested uh, as to ECHR compliance in terms of the Parliament's legal uh, advisor's role. And I would assume, therefore, that this is not an exception to that rule. Um, I note also what has been said about the fact that these regulations per se do not provide an appeal mechanism, but that the appeal mechanism for something that the UK government really is taking away is, is now subject to, uh, to being looked at to hopefully, as you say, as Mr Hayes, Hayes said, to provide perhaps something better than what was in place before. Um, ultimately, to my mind, I take very much on board what the Cabinet Secretary said in his letter of 26 February 2013, that he is determined to ensure uh, that as soon as possible there will be a system in place and, and uh, from what we've heard this morning, hopefully a better system and more time is, uh, uh, system in place. Um, and I think really taking into account all that has been said this morning, that is uh, what we should place reliance upon. And I'm perfectly happy uh, to do so. Uh, the situation, of course, is not ideal, but it is a situation really, I think, not of the Scottish Government's making. And I think the key thing here is to ensure that the vulnerable individuals that we have talked about already this morning uh, are not going to um, uh, see any cuts as a result of UK Government action, uh, or simply as a result of this issue, which has um, an important element. Uh, it's not to say that 79 potentially 79 uh, appeals are not important, but I think it's important also to take into account the timing, uh, the practical timing of any appeals. And that's been quite clearly stated that even if somebody were to lodge an appeal on the 1st of April 2013, um, in terms of the processes that we already know about that would have to be gone through at the local authority level, um, it, there really is, um, uh, even taking a, an extreme hypothetical example, it seems to me a high... Uh, uh, highly unlikely that we would be looking at um, a, a date uh, being um, uh, coming up against a date where there was no uh, alternative mechanism in place. And, and I do speak from years of practical experience as a lawyer. I think you have to uh, uh, accept that you look at the, the legal position in terms of the provisions uh, in place, but also in terms of the practicalities of what is involved in invoking those provisions. I think that's very important. So. Uh, in terms of having listened to the debate, uh, I do agree that we're, where we are is not ideal convener, but nonetheless, for the reasons I have stated, uh, I am uh, very keen indeed to ensure that these regulations come into force on the date that they are intended to do, which is the 18th of March uh, of this year. Okay, thank you for that, Annabel. Uh, Ian? Just to, and I will be very brief, kind of follow-ups uh, following the discussion. Um, we, we've had, which I think I started off with my questions. I mean, I, I agree with Alec Johnson, that there's very little alternative except to pass these for the reasons that uh, Annabel Ewan has just, uh, has just outlined. But I remain rather concerned about the, the, the principle of our requirement to pass legislation on the basis that it's ECHR compliant and a little disturbed that Mr Haynes isn't able to give us uh, his assurance that the Scottish Government believes that to be the case. So, so my question is in two parts. Firstly, uh, is it possible then for Mr Haynes to consult with his colleagues and to correspond with the committee to provide us with that assurance uh, that these regulations are indeed, in the view of the Scottish Government, ECHR compliant uh, after the fact, but, but nonetheless, we're not in an ideal position, that's for sure. And secondly, 
if these regulations were never intended to introduce a new appeal system, does that mean that when the appeal system is designed, further regulations will come forward to the committee in order to put that in place? I think Mr Haynes has given that commitment to the last point already, but I'll invite Mr Haynes to reply. The, the answer to your second question is yes, we will have to. Um, we already... We, we already know that we will have to, do, have okay. to bring forward regulations under sections 80 and 81 of the 1992 Local Government Finance Act to create a different appeals mechanism. And I can tell you now it will be called a review, not an appeal. Okay. And to be fair, Mr. Free asked another uh, part of his question in relation to the... the, the uh, I mean, it's, it's the best answer I can give you to that is, is first of all, an, a, an absolute agreement that we are very happy to come back on that point. Um, I, my, my initial feeling is the response would go something like, uh, in strict legal terms, in strict legal terms, there is an appeals mechanism in place. It's called the Valuation Appeals Committee. But we all know that with the position we are now in is that, in practical terms, doesn't, isn't going to work. So in strict legal terms, there is an appeal, appeals mechanism. But we can have that assurance ap after the fact. Yeah. OK. Is okay. everyone satisfied? And so far as they've had their chance to have their say uh, thus far, okay. Uh, in that case, are we uh, uh, content to note uh, the instruments at this stage? Yeah. Okay. Can I uh, thank uh, both Robin Haynes and Jenny Bruff for uh, coming along? I'm just going to allow for a short uh, four-minute break. We'll come back at ten to uh, to allow for a change of witnesses.
for subordinate legislation, passported benefits uh, regulations. Uh, I thank all the witnesses for their forbearance. I think they were told they'd be starting a little uh, earlier, but we always took a bit longer in terms of the last agenda item. Uh, we're going to hear uh, oral evidence from uh, Scottish Government officials on uh, the uh, statute transmissions that have been laid in connection with making provision for access to po passport benefits in light of welfare reforms. And I hope the witnesses will forgive me because there's so many of you. I'm not going to introduce each of you uh, in turn, but we do have three uh, statute instruments, and uh, I suggest that we deal uh, with each one in turn, inviting the officials to give us an explanation of the effect of the instrument, uh, after which I uh, will obviously uh, let members have a chance to ask any questions uh, they might have. So if uh, members are content uh, with that approach, are members content with that approach, Anna Well. Well, I was just saying, given that the, the, the officials are sitting yes, in a particular yes. order, I think it would be helpful if they could briefly just introduce themselves and say... Well, they can, they can do that uh, when they're, when they're speaking. speaking to okay, the instrument. So, that that's okay. you saying yes, you're content with my approach, which I'm very grateful for. Um, the, the first one we'll take then is the uh, free uh, school uh, lunches SSI, then the PIP-related uh, SSI, and concluding with the universal credit related prisons. And I understand those officials who are speaking to the uh, free school lunches instrument may have to uh, disappear off, so that's why you're first. So who's going first? Mr Spivy? Or... Sorry, uh, Anne, okay. Um, yes, if, if, if it's okay, I was just going to kind of set a little bit of An context to, to the of regulations, for, first of all, um, and maybe just very briefly in terms of order, as you rightly surmised, these, these are my colleagues that work on free school lunches. This is Stuart from Legal Directorate, and then we have colleagues that deal with concessionary bus travel, uh, and then colleagues that deal with blue badge parking. So that's kind of the order in which we're, 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 we're sitting. Okay. Um, but we'll all speak when we get to our kind of relevant sections of, of, of the regulations. So, um, when the Deputy First Minister was last at this committee on the 8th of January, um, she outlined her intention to bring forward legislation to um, allow universal credit to be used as a qualifying criterion for income-based passported benefits during the universal credit pathfinder period, um, include criteria for disability-related passported benefits um, to account for the introduction of personal independent payments, um, and to make changes to um, other non-passported benefits um, that need to be amended as a consequence of the UK government welfare reforms. And that's led to the, the three instruments that are in front of the, the committee this morning. Um, we're quite conscious that the, the legislation is um, pretty much a list of amendments, and it's therefore quite hard to understand what the practical effect of the instruments are. So to help with that, we've produced the tables that went out in the papers um, for today's meeting to try and um, kind of uh, uh, make it clearer what, what the effect of, of the, the individual um, sections will be. And as um, the uh, chair has already um, mentioned, we'll, we intend to go through each in turn so that there's an opportunity to review um, each section within each piece of legislation um, and take questions from the committee. The changes in relation to universal credit um, con um, concerning passported benefits, that, th these, that legislation is only to protect access for anyone who leaves the, um, the universal credit pathfinder fair, um, area in Greater Manchester and comes to Scotland. Um, and I should say that the probability of that happening is probably quite low. Um, the DWP estimates that there will be around about 5,000 people in receipt of universal credit um, in the Pathfinder area, and those claimants have to meet very specific um, characteristics, and DWP has set out those characteristics in their um, transitional, protection, uh, tra transitional provisions regulations. And basically, you have to be single, you have to be over 18, you have to be unemployed, you have to be fit for work, and you can't be a householder. So it is a very small group of people and a very small number. Um, and as I say, the probability of people leaving Manchester and coming to Scotland during that period is, is probably low. But um, nevertheless, the Deputy First Minister decided that it was better to make um, legislation or make provision for that eventuality during the Pathfinder period. And that is very much um, against the commitment to bring forward further legislation to set out um, more fully criteria for pa income related passported benefits before universal credit starts to roll out within Scotland. The changes in relation to PIP are a little bit more substantial and they effectively set out the passporting arrangements um, uh, from, from PIP. 
um, for disability-related passported benefits, and the criteria for that were set out in the Deputy First Minister's letter to the committee um, dated the 22nd of September. Um, and we thought that this was an area where there might be more questions from the committee, which is why I've brought along colleagues from Transport Scotland this morning um, to respond to any queries there. Um, and not to be outdone, for good measure, I brought along my colleagues that deal with free school lunches. Um, and despite the fact that there are quite a lot of us here this morning, it is possible that we might not be able to respond to every single question that you might ask us about these three pieces of legislation, in which case we'll, we'll take it away and come back to you in writing. But we will do what we can to deal with any queries that you have this morning. Well, thank you for that uh, opening statement. Can I uh, ask, uh, I, th I think you indicated, was Mr Spivin, Ms Barry are going to speak to the free uh, school meals? I'm going to ask Mr Foster to lead off from the legal side of things and then we can pick up on okay. any questions. I'm glad just someone's keeping up Mr Foster. <laughs> okay. um, just very briefly as to why we have a separate instrument um, in this case. Uh, the other two instruments are made under the Welfare Reform for the Provisions Scotland Act. In the case of the Education Scotland Act, uh, it already had a um, tailor-made mechanism um, for adding qualifying benefits, uh, a mechanism that was put in in the past when it was found that benefit changes uh, in the UK um, gave rise to the need for changes in Scottish primary legislation uh, about free school lunches. So the mechanism's there, and we thought it was the most appropriate um, route to use to, to, to do what's needed now. Um, just very briefly, and quoting from the explanatory note on these regulations, they amend the Education School Lunches Scotland Regulations 2009 so as to prescribe universal credit, which is payable under Part 1 of the Welfare Reform Act 2012, for the purposes of paragraphs A4 and B3 of Section 53.3 of the Education Scotland Act 1980. The effect is that where a pupil is or the pupil's parents are in receipt of universal credit and the pupil is receiving school lunches, the Education Authority must not charge for the lunches. Okay. Um, is there any supplementary comment as far as should I? Okay. Just open it up to any. Are there any questions from any of the. Jackie? I mean, the, the actual instrument is straightforward. My, my question is more general. Um, the Cabinet Secretary's aspiration was one that the committee shared that all those who currently receive passported benefits should continue to receive passported benefits. Is it the case that with the school meals regulations that is completely covered or have some people dropped out of eligibility? Um, uh, yeah, people will, who um, are currently eligible will continue to remain to be um, eligible um, under this uh, um, regulation. So even if they lose entitlement to, say, the, the, from the conversion from DLA to PIP, that they may lose entitlement, um, they will still be eligible? The free school lunches is predicated on income-related passported benefits. So the transition from DLA to PIP doesn't, isn't material in this. This is about people transferring onto universal credit. Um, and the answer to that question is, is yes. Will be covered. Thank you. That's helpful. That clear then? Yes. OK. Is everyone else satisfied? Yes. Yeah. OK. Well, uh, thank you uh, for that. And I'm aware that the officials that were <laughs> here to deal with all our questions about free school meals, which they've been waiting for, may have to head off now. So. Uh, can I now invite the officials uh, who are here to speak to the instrument related to uh, PIP to, to do so? Who, who is that going to be, Ms McBee? Um, is, Mr. F is, it go is Mr Fubus going to speak to all of them? Yes. Okay, sure. then that will be clear for a minute. Okay, Mr Fubus. Um, the instrument we're dealing with here is the Welfare Reform Consequential Amendment Scotland Regulations 2013. Uh, it's an instrument involving um, the amendment of eight separate pieces of subordinate legislation. Uh, I don't know if the committee would find it useful to go through them regulation by regulation, or... Well, Mr Johnson to my right is saying yes, so... Okay. Um, maybe well, a general the, view the easiest the... thing may be if I simply read for the record um, what is on the table that was issued to committee members that gives a very brief description of what, what each regulation does. Regulation 2 of the instrument uh, deals with the Council Tax Discount Scotland Regulations 1992. Uh, which provide for care workers to be disregarded for council tax, that is effectively treated as, they, as if they do not live in the property, incurring no liability and not affecting any claim for single person's discount by another resident, for example. This treatment is conditional and a number of factors are to be taken into account. These include that the individual in question is providing care to a person who is in receipt of the highest rate of the care component of a disability living allowance. 
The amendment adds to Regulation 23C of the 1992 regulations a reference to the daily living component of personal independence payment at the enhanced rate so that a care worker will be disregarded if caring for a person in receipt of such an allowance. Shall I simply move on to the next regulation? Yeah, I, I think yeah. I'll stop for questions. Each one, just go through them. Okay. Um, regulation 3 deals with the National Assistance Assessment of Resources Regulations 1992. The amendments proposed to these regulations allow for the disregard of income respectively from the, mo the mobility component and the daily living component of personal independence payment in the calculation of income other than earnings. The intention of these amendments is that those who currently receive either the mobility or the care component of disability living allowance will not have their income from personal independence payment treated differently for the calculation of income following the introduction of personal independence payment. Regulation 4 concerns the Advice and Assistance Scotland Regulations 1996. Regulation 16 of those regulations make provision as to exceptions from the general rule that a solicitor providing advice and assistance must first recover fees from property recovered or preserved before seeking any payment from the Scottish Legal Aid Board. That regulation is amended so that if the advice and assistance gives lead, given leads to the mobility component of personal independence being paid, then any payments of that allowance are accepted from the rule referred to. Uh, regulation 5 is slightly more substantial and is dealing with blue badge matters. It amends the Disabled Persons Badges for Motor Vehicles Scotland Regulations 2000. Uh, there are three um, basic groups of amendments uh, here. Firstly, the amendment to Regulation 4.2 uh, will create a new category of person entitled to a blue badge. The category covers pers certain personal independence payment recipients, thus allowing that benefit to be used as a passport to obtain a blue badge. The amendments to Regulation 6 of the 2000 regulations concern the period for which a blue badge may be issued. Those passporting from personal independence payment will get a badge for three years or, if shorter, until the date on which their PIP award expires. Finally, the amendments to Regulation 9 of the 2000 regulations will allow a person who, following assessment, does not receive a relevant PIP award to continue to use their blue badge until its expiry date. I don't know if convener if members want to discuss that now or do I just move on to the next one? Well, I mean, we've, I think we'll just go through, I mean, members, I'm sure, will want to discuss that. Okay. We'll just go yep. through uh, those ones to the end of the instrument. and then we'll come back. I'm sure they won't forget. Okay. Um, <laughs> regulation 6 of this instrument uh, amends the re repayment of student loans Scotland regulations 2000. Uh, the definition of disability related benefit in regulation 2 of these regulations is amended so as to include personal independence payment. The result is that someone in receipt of PIP may have student loan liability cancelled out if permanently unfit for work. Regulation 7 amends the Civil Legal Aid Scotland Regulations 2002. Schedule 2 to these regulations makes provision concerning the computing of an individual's disposable income in connection with an application for civil legal aid. Paragraph 7 of that schedule provides for certain allowances and benefits to be disregarded when carrying out this exercise. The amendment as currently framed adds the mobility, of compo the mobility component of personal independence payment to that list of allowances and benefits. However, when studying these regulations after they've been made, we have ascertained that that is in fact an error uh, and that we should be uh, taking out of account um, total personal independence payment, not just the mobility component, so that a fresh instrument will be brought forward in due course to deal with that. Um, regulation, nine, uh, regulation 8 amends the Council Tax Discount Scotland Consolidation and Amendment Order 2003. Uh, regulation 4 of that order sets out conditions to be fulfilled before a person can be disregarded for Council Tax purposes, that is effectively treated as if, as if they do not live in the property, on the basis that the, basis that the person is severely mentally impaired. At present, a person fulfils the condition of being in receipt of a qualifying benefit if in receipt of the highest or middle rates of disability living allowance care component. The amendment introduces a reference to the daily living component of personal independence payment. Finally, uh, Regulation 9, which again is a bit more substantial, amends the National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons, Eligible Persons and Eligible Services Scotland Order 2006. The amendments to that order will enable all who receive personal independence payment at either the standard or enhanced rate to be eligible for a concessionary travel card, and those who receive the daily living component of PIP at either the standard or enhanced rate to be eligible for a companion card. These criteria have been assessed as the most likely to mitigate the impact of the UK Government's welfare reforms on the concessionary travel scheme, 
being closest to the current eligibility criteria for those in receipt of disability living allowance. In additional transitional arrangements are put in place to allow those who have been in receipt of a concessionary travel card or companion card, but who following assessment don't qualify for PIP to continue to be eligible under the scheme until the expiry of the card. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was very comprehensive and we appreciate that. Uh, I think I've got Jackie for a, a question if other members want to ask they can indicate. Jackie. Thank you very much, Convener. Can I welcome the clarification of the Civil, civil Legal Aid Scotland regulations and look forward to the new instrument coming forward. Um, can I go back to where I started, which is the aspiration and the ambition of both the Cabinet Secretary and this committee was that um, everybody who lost benefit in the migration from DLA to PIP would still be eligible for passported benefits. If my reading is correct, that actually hasn't been achieved. Which, in, in which if you look, if, well, we'll start with blue badges as, as, as one, and, um, and the, I think the concessionary travel scheme also um, operates on, on a similar basis that um, whilst in the documentation, um, coverage is, is there for people who move from DLA to PIP um, and indeed for by widening the criteria, um, including more people. Um, there is nevertheless with the blue badge scheme, I'm searching for the figure, 27% may not receive a PIP award and will therefore not qualify for a blue badge through the passporting process. Um, so potentially 27% of people, once their blue badge expires, won't qualify. So. What I'm trying to tease out is that doesn't actually meet the ambition we had. And was there a particular problem? Because I understand that it would be complex in trying to continue eligibility for that group of people. Um, the, 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 that group of people will also be able to apply through the normal eligibility criteria. So um, may be able to, to acquire a blue badge and, through that route. Um, but, um, yes, the, our, our main uh, aspiration for this was to put in place passporting, which was equivalent to what we had under the higher rate mobility component, component DLA, and that's what we believe that we have done. Um, what, if we had have look, looked um, at any of the other um, criteria in the new, new PIP arrangements, then we may have had equivalent numbers, but we believe that those people may not have been the same people who were currently receiving higher rate mobility component DLA, so it wouldn't be equivalent in, in the people who were receiving it who would, who would then qualify for PIP. So the criteria that, that we've put in place, we believe, offers us the best solution um, to keep the most um, people protected who were formerly receiving um, the equivalent in DLA. And then, as I say, they also have um, the ability, once the blue badge expires, to apply through the eligibility criteria in the blue badge. But they, they might not be eligible if one of the key passported benefits is PIP rather than... Because DLA won't exist anymore. DLA won't exist anymore for working age people, mm -hmm. yes, that's correct. So um, they may not get a passport because they don't come under the, the PIP okay. criteria, which we believe are equivalent to what the higher rate component mobility is, sure. purely because in reassessment by DWP, they may assess them out of that category. It's something that, that we can't mitigate against, but we believe then that they have the separate route that they can come through the eligibility criteria for the blue badge. Okay. So the, the issue there is, so I'll come back to you in a minute, Jackie, just to clarify this, is that they might not be passported on, but they are still eligible under alternative means. They, they can still apply under the eligibility criteria. They then go through it's a, an assessment, local authority assessment, um, through um, a, an assessment process, a desk-based process, and then on through a, another tier process through occupational therapists to assess their mobility. Okay. Um, and, and they would be able to apply through that route. Jackie. The criteria for blue badge is the same across 32 local authorities? It is now, yes. It is um, now. We've, we've, okay. we've undergone a reform process which has standardised that process okay. across all 32 local authorities. Given that you think 27% may not make it through the passporting <coughs> process, um, how many do you think might just not be captured despite your best efforts? Well, that's something that we can only estimate. But I think that there was a... The figures in the, in the third tier who wouldn't apply at all. Wouldn't. The percentage, there's 46% in there. 
while colleagues are, are looking for the figures, I mean, one of the things that, that we, we want to do over the coming months is work quite closely with stakeholders to make sure that people understand what the new criteria are, both against you know, both the new passporting arrangements and um, kind of making greater awareness of the alternative criteria under which people may apply so that they, to reduce the risk of people falling out of, of um, passported benefits. I think that's very helpful, but it's... it's fine. The people who wouldn't be... Who, who believe um, over the period where DWP will be doing reassessments, and we believe that that will be in the number of 100,000 people who would be reassessed. Of those 100,000, um, at the moment, we believe that 60% of people um, who receive higher rate mobility component mm -hmm. daily go on to apply for a blue badge. So, so drilling those figures down, um, we think that the people who wouldn't be able to passport might, might come into the region of 27%, but those people would still be able to apply through the eligibility yeah. criteria, we don't then know how many of those numbers would succeed or not so, beyond that. So, but but they would be able to apply through the, the okay. number eligibility criteria. So the criteria. aspiration of, of of achieving 100% coverage is obviously um, you know fallen short because of the complexity of the systems we're operating. Would that be fair? Uh, that's one, that's one aspect, but the other aspect is that we have no control over DWP decisions. Award oh, no, pick. I understand that. So, um, it, I think what I'm uh, defaulting to is the committee's aspiration and the cabinet secretary's yeah. helpful aspiration that you know even if somebody fell out as a result of the DWP process, um, we would we would ensure that, that that they were covered. So I'm just trying to explore to what extent that that is possible given the complexities of the system. And I wonder, convener, if I might ask the same question of of concessionary travel, if, given that... Before you do that, I, I have Sorry. a question just about the Blue Badge scheme. Can you tell us uh, what is happening elsewhere in the UK uh, as opposed to the arrangements that have been put in place here in Scotland? In, or do they compare? Uh, um, in Wales, Wales are passporting in the same criteria as Scotland. Um, in England, Department for Transport have decided to tighten their crit criteria and they are only going to passport on um, the moving around component, which, ex you know, so they've now actively excluded those maybe with sensory impairment who would have previously come through the higher rate mobility component of DLA and can probably still passport, you know, come through PIP with sensory impairment. So, so, not, so a big problem. So in effect, Scotland and Wales have reached actually a better position in trying to maintain um, equivalency, as you know, to criteria wherever possible. Um, so the schemes in Wales and Scotland will encompass a wider uh, yeah. set, set of people. Okay, Jackie, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I was wanting to ask a similar set of questions to um, those responsible for concessionary travel in understanding um, how many would qualify, how many would potentially drop out, and you know, you're offering um, continuation of the transport card until its expiry date. Are they normally for three years? Uh, just to say, I think the, uh, the three years is a function of the sort of time limits put on DLA linked disability linked yeah. cards. So you know they, they would normally have a time limit on them in any case, sort of which they've come up for reassessment. And, and in fact, the regulation is that if a card issued by virtue of DLA was you know the PIP, but the individual was reassessed for PIP and came out of DLA, they would still have a card, but only the expiry of the life of that card. Uh, after that point, uh, if they were in receipt of, well, or indeed before that point, if they were in receipt of PIP, they would qualify for card on those grounds. If they weren't, then they could apply on the basis of the other grounds in, in the, uh, in the base, basic grounds for eligibility. They're somewhat different from Blue Badge in the sense that I think there's a longish list and they are fairly sort of well defined and objective. There is a question if you bring proof and if, for example, you've lost a uh, one or both lower limbs, or if you are profoundly deaf, then you qualify for the card on those grounds. I don't think, I'll stand to be corrected, I don't think we have a detailed understanding of how many people have a DLA-linked card at the moment who would qualify under some of the other more specific grounds in the eligibility of regulations. It's, it's the same as with the, with the blue badge in that we know who will qualify because we have the criteria that DWP have, have provided what we don't know is the characteristics of the individuals that will lose out as a result of the, the move to PIP, so we aren't then able to say they would definitely qualify under other criteria. Yeah, so the, uh, we have, historically, we have not, I think, collected in any great detail the uh, information about applicants on the specific grounds of disability, for example, 
on which they were given a card uh, from, I think, February. Uh, we now collect the specific grounds of disability, which, which uh, should help us monitor the impact of this as it sort of comes in over the next sort of couple of years, which should give us an indication of whether there is any, if you like, systematic change in eligibility that might need to be addressed. Okay. Can, can I just pursue just two small points following that? If, if you're making the same assumption as, as your colleagues responsible for blue badges, then you're looking at potentially 60% um, qualifying under the change from DLA to PIP, but 40% falling out. And if I've heard you correct, you're doing a piece of work to kind of establish what the underlying characteristics are and therefore determining whether they would be eligible or not. Is there any plan? So basically the gap is as much as 40%. Is there a plan to be flexible about the eligibility criteria in the future if you are monitoring those characteristics? We, we have been able to do some work based on, on the information we've received from DWP um, of the, the using the, the, the information they provided on outcomes of reassessment we think that up to, to 40,000 eligible people who currently are eligible for concessionary travel as a result of DLA would receive no PIP award. Um, that's a, a maximum figure, and there's about at least 50% of people eligible take up. So it's, you're looking at around 20,000 people would potentially lose out. There's some assumptions in there, though, that, that mean the number will probably be, below, be lower than that. Um, we only know of all DLA claim, DLA recipients the proportion that will get no award. So we've had to assume that people with a higher rate award will have the same chance of losing their award completely as people on a lower rate. Um, so, so that's why we think that's a, a top end estimate and the fix likely to be below that. Is the intention to afford flexibility in the criteria going forward once you identify the characteristics? I think the intention would be to review the criteria in the light of experience over the next couple of years. The criteria as they are are, fair, are specific and well defined. So it's, I think maybe a question more of whether the government wishes to bring forward changes to the criteria if, if something is emerging from a pattern of, if you like, you know, people dropping out of eligibility and not, not managing to get in by virtue of one of the other grounds. But that's something we, we will have to see in action. I think we don't, can't model of that degree of detail at this stage. Okay, thank you, convener. Kevin? Uh, thank you, convener. I think um, it would be a good idea if we could clarify um, that no one who currently has a, a blue badge or a national concessionary travel card will have that taken away from them if they currently have one. Um, that will run till its expiry, is that correct? On both counts? Okay. Um, so, in many cases, we will have a period of time to look at uh, how many folk actually fall out of eligibility from passporting, that would be fair to say. Um, can I ask, in terms of around about uh, Miss Mulholland's comment, where um, she said that now uh, all 32 uh, local authorities are operating on the same basis uh, mm. for blue badges, um, is, is that the case when it comes to eligibility criteria or is it the case that some local authorities still have uh, some of their own? Or is it interpretation? There, there is a national scheme and we do have um, a set of elig eligibility criteria mm -hmm. which um, is, is consistent across that national scheme. Um, and that was um, brought in in legislation um, last March, I believe, and um, we introduced a, what we called an independent mobility assessment with occupational therapists from September in legislation this year. So yes, it should be consistent. I can't comment as to whether local authorities are all abiding by that, but yes, <laughs> that, that, that is the intention. So Linda's just got a very yeah, quick sure. supplementary. Yeah, Can it, come it, back it was just really for the record, in my experience, interpretation does matter in these regulations, even within a local authority, in different parts of that local authority, the interpretation of the regulations uh, does actually apply. 
Um, if, if I could come back, and, and again, it's interpretation, convener, um, because Aberdeen City has a green badge scheme as well as the blue badge scheme. Um, I believe it is the only local authority that now has that scheme. Um, uh, where does all of that fit in? Shouldn't. <laughs> it's not officially recognised. Okay, I knew that. I kind of knew that was going to be the answer, but I, I thought that it was wise to do so. I, I, I mean, again, this is this is the the thing about local authorities sometimes uh, doing their own thing, and and you know, interpretation is a great thing, and in, in terms of there's any leeway. Um, if, if we could stick to, to the actual eligibility criteria, um, and you said that there's some work going on to, to look at that at this moment in time, what kind of things are we talking about looking at? I, th I think what we've, we've done is we've just redef we, we redefined the, um, elig part of the eligibility criteria for the Blue Badge last year. Just to make it to bring that consistency in local authorities across local authorities, and um, slightly ironically, we redefined it in line with the higher rate mobility component of DLA. Um, but um, we we still think that you know um, that offers a more consistent approach. And what we did was we redefined the mobility aspect um, to um, bring in um, a. The, the eligibility criteria, we, we, we redefined it just to say that a person is unable to walk or virtually unable to walk um, or the exertion required to walk would constitute a danger to their life. Oh, sorry, that's the DLA one. Yeah, that's, um, so that's what we, we brought in. Um, Now, what we believe is that will actually that has actually you know probably brought more consistency across the local authorities, bringing in that in tandem with the independent mobility assessments, has allowed um, occupational therapists to work to um, a model that um, can be applied across all local authorities, where before the arrangements were very much down to what happened in local areas. So we saw great inconsistencies across the award of badges and the um, types of um, mobility impairment that was being awarded badges. So hopefully over the next two to three years, we will see consistency come in across the local authorities. Okay, thank you. If I could move on, convener, to the National Bus Travel Concession Scheme. Um, it has been suggested that some of these changes uh, that we have in front of us today may actually see an increase in eligibility. Has any analysis been done on that? The, uh, the, headline, the headline expected increase in eligibility to apply is around 171,000 individuals now, moving up to 174,000 individuals, I think, by 2017 or 2018? 2018. 2018. So if you like, that's the long run expected change, other things being equal in terms of the numbers of individuals who will be eligible to apply for cards. And within that total, there's a number of people who are eligible to apply for companion cards. Uh, and the similar forecast is that the numbers eligible would move up from 125,000 to 134,000. Because okay. again, it's eligibility to apply. About half of people who are eligible apply, and then of course it's costs, if you like, depend on usage, costs and benefits. Okay, thank you. Annabel. Uh, thank you, Peter. Just uh, briefly going back to the blue badge, I just there was one point I wanted to clarify, and it's in the annex uh, that was provided. Uh, in the letter from the Cabinet Secretary. And um, one statistic was given, I'll just read it out, in terms of Blue Badge. Um, we have mitigated for uh, a group of around 29% who may receive a decreased award by setting the criteria for passporting at eight points or more for the, quotes moving around activity. This is comparable to the current arrangement and will ensure that the majority will continue to passport. Could somebody just clarify um, the position with respect to that because by picking the, the threshold at eight points, excuse my ignorance, but how, how does that then equate with the current situation and, and actually, you know, then therefore mitigate uh, or this group of people? Higher rate, sorry, under higher rate mobility component DLA, um, 
in change, you know, um, the criteria seems to be wider um, for mobility. When we looked at the threshold for PIP, it would have removed a lot of people from the higher rate of PIP, enhanced rate of PIP. The intention would be to, of DWP would be to remove a lot of people from the enhanced rate of PIP and reduce them down to the standard rate of PIP at eight points. Um, what we wanted to do was mitigate against this so that um, we would protect a lot of people on the higher rate, or you know, a number of people on the higher rate mobility who had fallen, who had maybe not lost the reward through PIP, but had maybe had a reduced payment. So we've, um, we covered, we included the standard rate at eight points or more. Okay, and is it correct to say that, that you anticipate, that the, the Scottish Government anticipates that, that this. Well, it, it's not clear the percentage that you anticipate rather being um, th that will benefit uh, in terms of we this. We can't anticipate the percentage because we actually don't know what's going we to We know that DWP have um, publicly intimated the intention to reduce um, awards um, under PIP. Um, and all we can do is actually try and mitigate, mitigate against it for passporting through that, we can't actually say how many, because DWP haven't told us how many, sure. and at what Can levels. I just clarify, those, are these the people that we were talking about earlier in terms of these are the people that are covered by the uh, initiative that's been taken by the Scottish Government and the Welsh Assembly Government? That's the end response yeah. to the question. Well, I was going on to ask, Convener, the other nations of the UK, uh, what, what have they done? So it seems that Wales has taken the same approach, or we've taken the same approach as well. Uh, what, what's happening in England on the specific England mitigating, on that mitigating, specific mitigating factor? Agree that, and that's the way they're going. Mm -hmm. that, so. And it's right. And uh, they're, they're following the eight points. Or Wales. More. Yeah. And England. What are they doing on this? England as well. They're, they're doing, doing this as well. As well. Yeah. So this seems to be a kind of a general measure. Presumably, on the underlying basis that there's still the benefit that can be passported from. It's when yes. you get into the territory where there's no underlying benefit that the issue of passporting becomes a bit moot in, in strict legal terms because there's nothing to passport from, which I guess is something you've been wrestling with for some time. At all, yes. The, the difference in, in ourselves in Wales and England is that what Sharon's just been describing to you were the moving around mobility activities. Um, and our sale, with our sales in Wales, we've also um, put in one of the criterion from the um, planning and following a journey, which we believe then fully brings in um, all the intention of high rate mobility component DLA, which DFT haven't followed. Okay. Thank you. Convener. Just one final question, Convener. Uh, obviously, um, these changes are, are going to have a, a major effect. Um, and some folk um, uh, who would have directly passported, um, and well, I commend you for, for trying to do the best that you can, but some folk will have to enter through uh, eligibility criteria. Will there be um, a campaign put in place uh, telling folk um, that they can still apply through the el eligibility criteria method to ensure that as many people as possible uh, still get access to blue badge and national concessionary card schemes? something um, DW, we're working with at the moment with DWP to put in place um, pointers in their letters, in their award letters and their no award letters to say that people can contact their local authority um, to apply for blue badges. Um, there's also a, a frequently asked questions section leaflet that um, DWP are issuing through personal independence payment, which will also have pointers on blue badge schemes and national concessionary and other concessionary um, schemes across the country that are available across the country. Um, we ourselves um, are looking at how we actually get um, the information to local authorities through our guidance pack um, and how we um, Work with local authorities to get that information out to um, maybe current blue badge holders who may be affected by this um, without actually causing fear and alarm sure. um, to people. 
And the WP have agreed to do all of this in the literature that they are putting out? Yeah, they've actually been quite proactive with this. Um, I suppose that's the least they can do, convener, considering the slash and burn of the uh, Westminster government when it comes to these mm -hmm. uh, benefits. Thank you. I don't necessarily expect to uh, comment on that uh, last uh, part. Uh, is, is that exhausted questions in relation to the PIP uh, instrument? Okay, before I uh, invite Mr Fubister to, to speak to... I'm just going to clarify, it is Mr Fubister that's speaking to us here. Speak to the instrument related to universal credit. And I hope he takes this the right way. There were uh, eight uh, specific uh, regulations in the last one. There are 21 here, so rather than dealing with each and every single one of them, could you take, deal with the ones that you think would necessarily need the additional information? Because I would remind uh, members we do have the paper in front of us, so members are still capable of asking questions in any uh, number of them. But uh, if you could just perhaps summarise it rather than go through it, each and every one. OK. As Anne said uh, at the outset about universal credit, um, the intention of this instrument is what you might call a stopgap measure. Um, there's a pilot scheme being um, run for universal credit um, before rollout in, in more widely um, in Scotland and, and other places in the United Kingdom. So effectively, this instrument is um, dealing with the possibility of someone from the pilot area ending up in Scotland. Um, that's about all it does. So there isn't anything of any great controversy in it. Um, I don't actually think I could pick out anything um, from it that is um, particularly noteworthy. Um, the annex um, does indicate what each and every um, change, um, what effect it has. Um, I'd be only too happy to take questions, but I'm not sure that it would benefit hugely to, to give much more of a detail. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. Do members have any specific questions? I do have a question. I have a comment, convener, in the fact that um, this is being ultra, ultra careful, uh, I would say. Uh, and, you know, it shows in some regards uh, the way that the UK government are doing this, um, uh, this entire process uh, is causing even more bureaucracy uh, to deal uh, with uh, what may happen, but likely not. Um, I always think it's better to be safe than sorry, but the reality is that the UK government and, and their welfare reform setup is actually adding to the bureaucracy uh, that they say that they're trying to get rid of. Hey, Jackie. Um, I always get worried when there's a long list if you miss something out, and it just occurred to me, um, what are we doing? I'm sure you've got a wonderful answer for this but with school clothing grant entitlement? I don't have a wonderful answer to it. Oh um, okay. The exercise we did was a fairly extensive trawl around the, the Scottish Government to try and find all statutory references. Now, I, I simply couldn't tell you whether a school clothing grant is delivered through a statutory scheme or not. Neither could I. The start that the pilot involved single people. It does. It, it, it only involves single unemployed um, um, people who don't have household income. So it's it's very unlikely that there would be anyone that would move from Manchester come to Scotland that would. Um, That's true. Uh, Having said that, we, we did um, go to the, 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 the yes. length of doing school so free lunches. It's, it's, yes, uh. but um, just to, um, I, I can I can clarify the position in relation to school clothing grants. Um, it's not a Scottish government passported benefits. It's something that's at the discretion of local authorities. I'm not quite sure what the legislation that underpins the, those clothing grants is, but I'm quite happy to take that away and clarify it. I, I think and, that would be helpful if you, you could. Yeah, and, and maybe just to, to add, I mean, we are aware that there are other areas of legislation that will need to be amended. Um, um, to, um, there's some specific examples in relation to um, benefits for police and fire. Um, but because there are a broader suite of regulatory changes happening in, in association with the, the broader reforms for police and fire, they are being swept, you know they are being looked at within that context. So what we've presented today isn't the end of the story; it's the kind of start of the story, if you like, in terms of making sure that we pick up all these consequential amendments. So we've got more to come. Okay, well, we look forward to that. <laughs> uh, is that did, have anyone else got any question? Okay. Uh, that being uh, the case, can I uh, thank? Uh, officials uh, for their attendance today, for the evidence they provide. I remind members we have uh, further evidence on uh, uh, these matters at our next meeting. And I'm going to uh, briefly suspend the meeting just for uh, till uh, 22. So I'll suspend the meeting for 
six minutes.
Okay, we're going to kick off again. Um, okay, we move to agenda uh, item uh, five, which we have decided to take in uh, public before uh, we uh, discuss the paper uh, that's before us. Uh, can we all agree that the paper should be made uh, public now that we are discussing it in public? So, everyone's agreed? Okay. Um, so I uh, would like to invite uh, any uh, comments uh, on the back of the paper that has been uh, prepared uh, in advance of our uh, informal uh, meeting with the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Uh, can, you, can I just clarify how long uh, we have? I, I understand we have 30 minutes of his time. Uh, Is that correct? He's coming at about uh, half past three, I think, on the 27th of March, um, presumably I mean, suppose there's, the time constraints are on both sides because obviously we'll need to uh, we keep an eye on uh, decision time as well, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how long, how precisely he's there's got. not been any clear indication as yet of time. Um, okay. It's okay. Just so it's anticipated that. Okay. He might stay with us till decision time. He might. You never yeah, know. right. <laughs> okay. Can't help you make some decisions. <laughs> it will avoid commenting on that one, Alec. Okay, are there any. Uh, uh, other Linda and then Jackie. Oh, I just wanted to say I, th I think the paper reflects what we discussed at the committee in terms of, of how we deal with it. The, you know, the important bit being <coughs> that for all it's a, a meeting held without, not on record. That we have made it quite clear and it would apparently have been accepted that uh, anything that comes from that is there then in the public domain in, in terms of clarification and in terms of writing letters. That's okay. important. Yeah, of course, that was an approach with uh, previous similar meetings with other uh, yeah. UK ministers. Jackie then came. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, how much time we have is critical to determining the priority areas for questioning. But given that the paper is in the public domain now, uh -huh. um, I'm sure the minister's officials will be swarming <laughs> all over it. Could I suggest that if, the, if there is an issue, a genuine issue about time, uh -huh. that we attempt to at some point prioritise this? And I'm happy to leave that to the convener and the vice convener to do and suggest that we invite written responses to those questions that, that we may not have time to get to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's helpful, although I would observe that, you know, we're not trying to limit the range of questions that members may want to, to raise, but Absolutely. I, I, I take the point. Hey, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I thank the uh, clerks for the paper. I think it's uh, quite good for guidance. Um, I think it, it would be useful to know the amount of time that we have uh, in this uh, informal off-the-record meeting. Uh, I would reiterate that uh, I think that it should be formal um, uh, with no time lim limits uh, so that we can get to grips with the questions uh, that the people out there are asking us uh, about these welfare changes. Um, However, I do uh, agree with uh, Jackie. I mean, it would be uh, ideal if we could get some kind of indication of time so that we can prioritise our right line of questioning. Um, you know, in some regards, we could pick the topics for discussions today, but the reality is that the topic for discussion will probably change uh, between now uh, and the time that uh, uh, Mr Duncan Smith appears here, uh, because as we all know, uh, every day it seems that something else appears. So, you know, I, I think that we, if we could get an indication of time, I think that would be very useful. Uh, and uh, I think, again, I would agree with Jackie, uh, there has to be an agreement that uh, anything that we don't get to, the written questions that we have should be followed up upon by the Secretary of State. Well, I, I think, in, in fairness, that last point has more or less been agreed on. <coughs> clear that we'll follow up uh, any areas for to, to clarify. Um, so that, that more or less has been agreed to my understanding. In terms of trying to clarify, uh, I'm sure the clerks can seek to, to uh, clarify with uh, DWP officials how long um, the uh, Secretary of State will be with us for. Um, and yes, I certainly think the committee's uh, position in terms of uh, uh, having an on-the-record discussion is well made, and I'm sure the committee can continue to uh, reflect on that and, and proceed as it uh, uh, sees fit. Uh, Alec? Uh, I was just going to say that I also agree with Jackie that uh, even uh, if we do have quite a lot of time, I think we need to prioritise issues and ensure that we deal with them uh, in uh, a structured order and make sure that we do get 
the, the most important things dealt with. Uh, I very much welcome the fact that uh, Ian Duncan Smith has agreed to this informal meeting. Uh, I think it's important that we have a, an open dialogue with him and develop a constructive engagement and a positive relationship. And I think uh, this is a, a vital step in building that relationship in which we can demonstrate to Mr Ian Duncan Smith that we are not uh, confrontational and, and we do wish to engage, engage positively. I'm sure that goes for the whole committee, Alec. Um, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> right. Is, is that everything? Has anyone got any other observations to people? Okay, well, I'm sure the uh, clerks uh, will reflect uh, on what's been said uh, today. And uh, uh, that being said, I now close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.